So thank you for the introduction. Uh, I moved over to Oak Ridge National Lab about a year ago, January last year, just in time for COVID, um, which uh, obviously didn't help in, in, in settling in, but uh, we've, uh, everything is now working pretty much as it should. And I'm happy to give you an overview of the possibilities that neutron sciences at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, so uh, please go to the next slide. So I'm going to start with a bit of history. Uh, there, there's a lot of history of this lab. Uh, the lab, Oak Ridge National Lab, was founded with a different name back in 1943 as part of the Manhattan Project. Uh, and the initial uh, mission for, was to build a nuclear reactor, which turned out to be, which was the first uh, sustainable, um, should we say, uh, the first permanent nuclear reactor continuously operated uh, in 1943, and they built it in only 11 months, uh, which you know, is worth bearing in mind for those of us who have been involved in large-scale construction projects. There were times when th these things could be done more quickly. Uh, so it came online in November 1943, and it was able to deliver the first gram size amounts of plutonium already in March 1944. The reactor operated for 20 years, uh, and it was the first reactor to demonstrate the production of, of electricity, among other things, uh, using, using nuclear power. Uh, so if you can see from the photo there, that's a vintage 1940s picture uh, of how things were operated then. Next slide, please. Um, but very early on, it was recognized what could be done with neutron, neutron beams from, from this reactor. Uh, Ernie Wallen, who later was awarded the Nobel Prize together with Cliff Schull, uh, uh, started neutron experiments already in 1944 when the reactor first became critical. Cliff Schull joined in 1946 and in uh, the photo that you can see there is from 1949 when they were working on one of the first diffractometers for neutron research at the graphite reactor. Uh, so uh, Oak Ridge has been involved in neutron research for a long time. Uh, next slide, please. Things have obviously moved on since then. The picture you can see here is an aerial photo of the Oak Ridge National Lab site, and there's a number of things I want to point out there. Uh, you can see the graphite reactor site in the foreground, right? It shut down in the 60s. Uh, not surprisingly, it was 1940s technology. Uh, it was, uh, there were other reactors, which I'm not showing on here, uh, but the one remaining operating reactor on the Oak Ridge National site is the high flux isotope reactor, which you can see on the right, uh, which first went critical in 1965. Uh, that is still operating and it has a very active neutron scattering program. It was enhanced in capability by the addition of a cold guide hall, a, a cold source and a cold guide hall in 2004. And almost at the same time, you can see in the background on the left, we built the Spallation Neutron Source, came online in 2006, uh, a little bit separately up on a ridge, uh, uh, kind of overlooking the, the, the main ORNL campus. And we have a project uh, on track at the moment to build a second target station for the Spallation Neutron Source, which will uh, be up and producing science in 2034, according to our current plan. So sometime into the future. Uh, but the idea is that we right now, we have two neutron sources, HIFO and SNS, and in something like 10 to 13 years from now, we will have three neutron sources. So this is a particular unique feature of, uh, uh, of neutron sciences uh, at Oak Ridge, that we have more than one neutron source. And I'm going to go into that uh, in more detail as, we, as, uh, as, as I progress my presentation. Before then, I want to give you a bit more of the context of what is happening at Oak Ridge National Lab. Next slide, please. Uh, neutron sciences is actually only a small part of, overall of Oak Ridge National Lab. And here I'm giving an overview of the different other organizations within Oak Ridge National Lab, which I'm not gonna go into in detail, but I think it's useful to know what the context is. Uh, we have a physical scientist directorate whose mission is to deliver materials research. We have neutron sciences, of course. We have a high performance computing directorate uh, we have a nuclear science program uh, for developing uh, nuclear reactors. We have a very active isotope R&D and production program. We have an R&D program in biological and environmental sciences. 
we work in national security issues, and we work in integrating energy systems across this, which is, of course, very relevant right now uh, as we are working towards producing clean energy uh, for the carbon-free economy of the future. So we sit in this environment of a neutron source embedded within a larger organization whose primary mission is to deliver science. And I just want to pull out a couple of examples of that. Uh, next slide, please. The first example I want to show here is from the Computing and Computational Sciences Directorate. They actually operate one of the world's most powerful um, supercomputers. It was the world's most powerful until the Chinese built one that was more powerful. And the race is on. It'll, we'll soon have the most powerful one again. Um, and not only is it about hardware being able to do computing really quickly, it's about having the expertise in data science, uh, modeling, simulation to support and make use of these uh, high performance computing initiatives. Uh, so we are uniquely placed to deliver neutron scattering capabilities together with high performance computing together. And I'm going to go into, I'm going to give an example a bit later on in some of the research we did on COVID-19 last year, where we made use of that. Uh, hang on, I'm just going to sw switch arms because I'm <laughs> building my phone up, it's a bit tiring. Next slide, please. Uh, the other example is the Physical Sciences Directorate. They have about, that, that's a large organization. It's a similar size to Neutron Sciences. They have uh, literally hundreds of researchers whose job it is to deliver science uh, in a range of uh, physical sciences, ranging from uh, new materials, uh, uh, energy materials uh, to uh, particle physics, uh, the full range of physical sciences. Uh, and of course, key among the, the, the techniques they use to do that is, is making use of the neutron beams which are on their doorstep. So we are integrated into this environment of, uh, of users, if you like, internal users in the lab who push us to, uh, uh, to be able to be, to, to be impactful in the scientific areas that they are working in as well. Next slide, please. The, the final thing I wanna say, uh, could you go to the next slide, please? The one um, she's saying complementary capabilities. That's the one, thank you. Uh, the final example I want to give uh, of the environment is these two centers. We have a center for nanophase material science and a center for structural molecular biology. These are important because they actually provide access to complementary uh, capabilities in the Center for Nanophase Material Science, there's various imaging facilities, uh, notably a cryo electron microscope uh, uh, and various other scanning and uh, microscopy imaging techniques, uh, which can be very important in delivering the full picture, which you never, you rarely get the full picture from just neutrons alone. Uh, the Structural Molecular Biology Center, I want to particularly uh, mention because they have uh, the facilities for uh, deuteration, which are essential for um, um, isotopic labeling, uh, which is needed for getting uh, the full information out of neutron scattering experiments. They also have um, SACs and other supporting capabilities, which, uh, which are very useful complementaries to, uh, to neutrons. So next slide, please. So now I want to get on to neutrons at last. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have two neutron facilities at Oak Ridge. We have the high flux isotope reactor and we have the spallation neutron source. And they're very different, uh, they're very different technologies and they also have very different uh, types of science which they're able to perform. And I'm gonna go into that in a little bit of detail to explain now, what are the advantages of having these two different types of neutron facilities together in the same facility? Uh, next slide, please. So firstly, the spallation neutron source, uh, that is a uh, uh, similar technology to what was developed at, uh, at, at ISIS uh, in the UK, what is being built at ESS, right? It's built around a, part, a proton accelerator uh, uh, delivering uh, pulsed beams of neutrons. Here you can see the range of instruments. We have 19 operating instruments. 18 of them are in the materials research user program. One of them is in fundamental physics. Uh, there are uh, actually four available slots for new instruments. Uh, and one of those slots we are currently filling 
with an imaging instrument called Venus. But we covered the full range of, of instrument types which you would expect to see at a, at a high-end neutron user facility, diffraction, spectroscopy, materials engineering, small angle neutron scattering, and reflectometry. Uh, and I'm not going to go through the instruments in detail. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, at the high flux isotope reactor, that's, uh, uh, we have 12 instruments uh, in the user program, uh, and they are split into two different areas. To the left, you can see uh, the beam room. I don't really have a way of showing you with the cursor, but you can see around the pool, uh, you can see a, a, a number of instruments, and those are, they are thermal beam tubes. So these are thermal instruments. And then we have instruments in the cold guide hall, which branches off to the right which view the cold source. Uh, and they, we also cover a range of instruments there, diffraction, spectroscopy, small angle scattering, engineering, we have an imaging instrument. We also have a number of development beam lines. One of the advantages of, of, of a reactor source over a spallation source is it's actually fairly cheap to, to implement additional kind of parasitic beam lines uh, so that you can run uh, R&D programs and technologies in parallel. It's also worth mentioning that uh, HIFA operates a, a number of non-neutron beam programs. We have, we, we produce isotopes. That was what the reactor was originally built to do, hence the name, high flux isotope reactor, uh, for a variety of applications. We also provide irradiation facilities and activation analysis. And there's actually also a, a neutrino experiment going on there, which does not require a, a neutron beam. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on um, of the kinds of science which are best done at SNS or at HIFA. Um, so different types of experiments are sometimes only possible or best done at SNS or at HIFA. So SNS has some particular distinct advantages for specific science challenges. And as I said, it's, 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 it's key strengths of pulsed neutrons, pulsed beams of thermal or hot neutrons. So here are some science examples that illustrate these advantages. I'm not going to go into detail, but I do want to emphasize that they represent measurements that would have been very difficult or impossible at HIFA, and uh, they also have a very high potential impact for supporting new technology developments. So starting from the left, uh, this is an example from research from Duke University, which is in North Carolina. They used inelastic scattering to understand the dynamics of inorganic cesium lead bromide, that is a perovskite material, which, is, which has a lot of promise for solar cell applications due to their stability and electron transport capabilities, even in harsh environments. They have a very high power conversion efficiency, and that is in large part due to, their, to the bromine atoms, which act as hinges that enable the rest of the atom atomic structure to flex and twist. And this twisting motion is thought to inhibit some free electrons from recombining with the semiconductor electrons, leaving more electrons available to produce an electrical current. This new result uh, is expected to help scientists to optimize optical and thermal properties of a wide range of perovskite materials, some of which have already demonstrated that they can, they can provide more than 25% power conversion efficiency, which is actually better than that of silicon-based materials. The next example, uh, is from the University of California in San Diego. They use neutron diffraction to understand the distribution and movement of lithium in a disordered rock salt, lithium vanadate. That's a material, uh, it's another energy material which shows a lot of potential as an anode material for rechargeable lithium ion batteries with a very high energy density, which can be safely charged and discharged at high rates. And obviously important, can be important for things like electrified transportation. Um, so the two most common materials used to make lithium ion battery anodes are graphite, which can deliver high energy density, but has caused fires in some situations, and lithium titanate, which can charge very rapidly and is much less likely to cause fires, but it has a lower energy storage capacity. So the combination of low voltage and high rate capability of this disordered rock salt, the lithium vanadate, uh, is thought to be due to a redistributive lithium intercalation mechanism <laughs> in the barriers. The next example is from the researchers at the University of Virginia. 
they found a method to strategically add deuterium to benzene uh, as a precursor to drug synthesis, which uh, turned out to have really dramatic effects on the, on the efficacy of the drug and the safety, and sometimes even uh, to allow new medicines. Uh, the methods were validated by neutron diffraction to verify the exact position of the deuterium atom that resulted from the selective deuteration of the benzene molecules. The final example is from Manchester University in the UK. They used neutron diffraction and vibrational spectroscopy combined to understand the chemoselective alkyne and alkene separation by, from a nickel decorated zeolite. Specifically, they were found to occur with binding of acetylene to the confined nickel through the formation of metastable nickel-based complexes. And understanding and controlling these porous sorbents like zeolites can lead to cheaper and much more efficient separation of alkynes from olefin, which is a costly step in the polymer processing of the lower olefins, things like ethylene and propylene and things like that. Next slide, please. So here are some examples of science which is best done at Haifa, right? Uh, really playing to the strengths there uh, and things which would have been difficult or impossible to do at the, at the spallation neutron source. So again, from left to right, here is an example from researchers at University of California in Berkeley who use small angle neutron scattering to, refer to look at artificial proton pumps and see how they insert into biological membranes. Uh, this is very promising for synthetic biology. The polymers aren't synthesized in a sequence specific way, monomer by monomer, but from a mixture of monomers with different hydrophilicity and their statistical incorporation can be controlled by varying the reaction parameters to produce hetero regions that are on average more or less hydrophobic or hydrophilic or charged or uncharged. The next example, that is from researchers at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, sorry, I should say Notre, Notre Dame um, in Indiana. They worked together with uh, people from ILL and they used sands uh, at extremely low temperatures and high fields to investigate the topological properties of uranium platinum three. They looked at vortex lattices in the material uh, and found differences in their behavior depending on how the superconducting state was prepared. Specifically, the results show that the superconducting state in this, in this system uh, can be assigned a chirality or handedness and that this can be controlled by suitable magnetic field protocols. Uh, the third example is again from Duke University. They use neutron diffraction to reveal the relationship between applied magnetic field and crystal structure and electronic properties in a, in a, in a compound called trollite. Um, uh, the, the potential application from this experiment is the development of new spintronic devices. The last example here on the, on the far right is from the University of Virginia, who used neutron imaging to conduct in operando measurements on lithium batteries to track the migration of lithium ions during cycling in order to improve battery performance. Uh, so that was a quick tour de force of kind of currently high impact science, which is being done uh, has been done recently at HIFA and SNS and trying to showcase the differences in, in capability between pulsed and reactor sources. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now I want to get onto the example of what uh, we, one of the highlights of what we have been doing during last year. And of course, we've been very focused on COVID-19. Uh, there is a consortium which was set up of research facilities in the US, uh, including synchrotron sources um, at various places, uh, uh, high performance computing at Oak Ridge and Oak Ridge Neutron Sciences. Uh, and here you can see the combination of different, uh, how these different efforts have, have combined over last year uh, to help us better understand uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus and how to fight uh, COVID-19 as a disease. Next slide, please. So uh, the main, uh, uh, so SARS-CoV-2 replicates by invading a host and then it expresses 
um, a number of polypeptides that are cut into smaller pieces by the main protease enzyme called MPRO here. Uh, we want to understand that protease, the 3CL MPRO, it's called. Uh, it's an essential enzyme for viral, repli viral replication. And if we can inhibit its function, it will, it will make it unable to produce mature infectious virions. Uh, so the enzyme is a promising target, both for developing specific new drugs and for repurposing existing clinical drugs. So we started out by measuring the room temperature protease structure using X-rays. We then used the supercomputer to understand the energy landscape, and then we used neutron diffraction to locate the hydrogen atoms. Uh, understanding the protonation states in a number of critical active site cavities helps to understand the catalytic details of the enzyme and to inform rational drug development against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We found that the catalytic site of the protease adopts what is called a, a Zwitter ionic reactive form the Zwitter ion is a molecule that has at least two functional groups, one having a positive charge and the other with a negative charge with an overall charge of zero. And neutrons are particularly good at locating these hydrogen positions. Uh, so these results were done at uh, Imagine, the protein crystallography instrument at Haifa, and Mandy, the equivalent instrument at SNS. Next slide, please. We then looked at several promising drug candidates, uh, which are known to bind effectively with the MPRO protease. Uh, they were studied by uh, X-ray diffraction, and then we studied, and the shape and the rigidity of the active site cavity was determined. One of the most promising drugs, which is called telaprevir, was then studied using neutrons to determine the relevant protonation states. And it was found that a whole cascade of changes in protonation states takes place following the binding, which enhance this, the binding effect. So with the work continues on this, obviously COVID-19 is not, is not something that's over. Uh, neutrons are continuing to impact on the, on, in this area. They are ideal for locating hydrogen positions and for experimentally determining protonation states at near physiological temperature. That's an important point. Uh, this is done at room temperature, not at cryogenic temperatures. Uh, and the observations made, they provide the critical information for structure-assisted and computational drug design. Next slide, please. So here, I just want to uh, go back a little bit and talk about, now I, I want to go through various kind of science applications of, uh, other than neutrons. Uh, at Haifa and SNS, uh, other than in material science, should we say? Uh, so we do support fundamental physics. Uh, we have neutrino. We have neutrino experiments at both SNS and Haifa, um, uh, looking for gaps in our understanding of the of the standard model. Uh, we also have a dedicated Newton electric dipole moment experiment at SNS. Uh, Haifa is very active in producing radioisotopes uh, with a, a variety of applications, including medicine and industry. Uh, one of the particular highlights is you may have followed the landing of the Mars Perseverance rover uh, about a month ago. That is powered by plutonium-238, which was produced at uh, Haifa. Plutonium-238 is an alpha emitter, so it produces heat at a very steady rate. Uh, which, which uh, allows a thermoelectric system to produce electricity. Uh, HIFO also does a lot of materials irradiation, excavation analysis, and gamma irradiation. I'm not going to go into those in detail, but those are important parallel science missions uh, going on there. Uh, SNS, as the world's highest power proton accelerator, uh, is, is very active in accelerated physics, studying how to reduce beam loss, how to improve the performance of specific uh, accelerating cavities, um, and at the moment looking into uh, laser stripping um, to remove the uh, the electrons from the H minus ions, uh, which are which, which which come out of the LNA. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the kind of uh, um, uh, unintentional side 
impacts of COVID is that we have had to become much better at doing remote experiments. We are not able to accommodate users traveling here from outside the lab uh, uh, due to quarantine and, and travel restrictions, uh, which are still in place. So we rolled out a remote access experiment uh, back in April last year. Uh, users can participate by remotely providing direction to the instrument team. Uh, and this is our main mode of operation, has been our main mode of operation uh, since then. Uh, there's various software tools that we set up to improve that way of running experiments. At the same time, we're setting up genuine remote instrument control, and that's shown on the right, where we launched a pilot program in February this year. Uh, this has been gradually rolled out uh, across all instruments over time. It's not in place for all instruments. Uh, we started out with the four mentioned there, ARCS, Biosan, CNCS, and PowGen. And we, the plan is that we will roll it out to all instruments by the end of this year. It really means that from your university or wherever you are, you can connect uh, your computer to control the instrument and run the experiment from, from your office. Um, obviously, we would expect you to be communicating very closely with the instrument team who will need to be on the instrument as well at the same time. Next slide, please. Uh, both SNS and HIFA are very impactful scientifically. I want to show uh, what I'm showing here is the number of experiments completed on the left and the number of, number of publications uh, uh, on the right. Um, we have now reached, I would say, a steady state level of publications. You can see on the right there, we reached about a level of 500 papers per year. Uh, that's a very good level. This puts us on the same, this is at a, at a similar kind of scientific productivity level as, as other uh, top neutron facilities. Um, I would point out, if you look at this, at this slide on the right, I mean, there's some little symbols there, which um, uh, the uh, well, COVID-19, obviously, last year, the little spanners show technical issues that we had. We have had a, a significant amount of downtime in 2018 and 2019 due to issues with the high fuel element and due to issues with, this, with the SNS uh, target, uh, which is a liquid mercury target, which is a, a very, uh, it's, it's an it's a complex engineering uh, assembly. Um, and uh, there we had uh, a mercury leak within the target. Uh, it, it's, it's not a safety issue. We have, a, it, it sits inside a series of cavities to contain the liquid mercury if it leaks out of the inner volume, but we have to stop operation uh, when the innermost volume is, is, uh, is breached. Uh, and that resulted in a significant amount of downtime at, ES, at, ESS, at SNS uh, in 2019. Uh, and we would expect that to impact on our publication output in the, in, in, in the next couple of years as well. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, I just want to uh, point out that if you want to uh, do an, uh, an experiment at SNS or HIFA, uh, we are open to all uh, both US and international um, users. Uh, you should submit a proposal at one of our proposal calls that take place twice a year. Uh, you just missed one in March, the next one is September 22nd. We're actually right now going through the beam time, the proposal review process that's actually finishing today for the March 24th uh, proposal call. Uh, we typically get about 1,500 user proposals uh, in each round. Uh, we do have a large uh, a backlog of uh, experiments at Haifa because Haifa had a, uh, a, a, had a long a longish outage last year, several months. Uh, so uh, in, in the current round, some, some users may, may have noticed that not all HIFA instruments were available That's because they were the, the beam time was taken up by that backlog. Next round, all instruments should be available again in September. Uh, please do, uh, new users should bear in mind to contact the instrument scientist uh, in preparing their proposal. Uh, and you can go to this website uh, for, for more information on that. We have a rolling program of instrument upgrades, um, which I just want to highlight here. Uh, here I give some examples. We recently installed a 14 Tesla vertical field cryomagnet, 
expanding our maximum field from 11 up to 14 Tesla. Uh, this can be mounted on the chopper spectrometers. So it it's, uh, has already been successfully tested, I believe, on CNCS and ARCs. Um, uh, and, uh, um, and actually has uh, rather good background and angular coverage um, performance compared to other magnets that we had. Uh, we're going through a detector upgrade on Nomad. That's uh, our total scattering diffractometer, completing the detector array uh, and improving the background with, uh, with improved collimators. These are 3D printed collimators. Uh, we've also had to update a, a lot of the electronics to increase the count rate capability. Uh, we upgraded the detectors on HB3A. Uh, it's a single crystal diffractometer at Haifa uh, with a, a series of uh, silicon photomultiplier detector arrays with a much reduced pixel size uh, and uh, lower sensitivity to magnetic fields. Uh, and, and a greater area overall. Uh, we replaced the collimation systems for the two SANS instruments at HIFO, GP SANS and BioSANS, uh, which, which were in need of being modernized. Uh, and we now have the ability to incorporate uh, advanced optics or beam polarization in the collimation sections. Next slide, please. So now I want to look at look a little bit into the future. I'm just trying to see how much time I have. Um, look, look into the future. Uh, we have a number of um, projects, some which are already funded and progressing, and some which are more in which are in preparation, uh, in which we are trying to attract funding. So I'm going to go through some of these. Uh, uh, Venus and Discover. Those are the two instruments, instrument projects at SNS. The proton power upgrade, the second target station, um, the two big projects at Haifa, the, the beryllium reflector replacement and the pressure vessel replacement. Uh, and then finally, we, we have a project which we are studying uh, to build a beam line for muons, spin rotation and resonance, which will be combined with a single event effect um, uh, station. Uh, for neutron irradiation. Uh, that last point is something which I would emphasize is not yet funded, but we are, we are studying how that could be done. And technically we can see how to do it. Um, I'm gonna go through the other examples in a bit more detail now. Next slide, please. So starting with Venus. Uh, so Venus is, uh, has started installation. It started uh, spring last year, just in time for COVID. Uh, we've obviously had to adapt some construction uh, plans as a result, but it's actually progressing uh, as as planned after we adapted those uh, uh, the kind of the detailed timeline. The overall timeline is still in plan in place, and we and we expect to be able to 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 operate Venus as a as a as a new time of flight imaging instrument uh, by the end of 2023. Uh, and there you can see some of the uh, the. Uh, the progress at the moment. We inserted the core vessel, uh, core vessel insert earlier this year, which went, uh, which went well. Next slide, please. The other instrument which which we are currently working on is is called Discover. Um, it is a, uh, uh, it's a it's a diffraction instrument which falls intermediate between PowGen, which is a high resolution powder diffractometer, and Nomad which is a very high flux total scattering instrument. So this kind of falls more in between as a more general purpose powder diffractometer, uh, rapid acquisition, but with an, and medium resolution. Uh, we have, have been successful in getting, uh, 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 with the National Science Foundation in, in, in uh, going through the first round of selections. So we are now in the second selection round and have just submitted a, a proposal for funding to build the full instrument. Um, and we're obviously very excited about that possibility. Next slide, please. So at Haifa, uh, this is a project known as HBRR, the Haifa Beryllium Reflector Replacement. 
which will be accompanied by a series of instrument upgrades. So the reflector around the fuel element at Haifa is made of solid beryllium. And it needs to be replaced due to radiation damage every 20 years. Uh, so it was replaced last time in, in, in 2004, which was the time when we installed the cold source in one of the four beam tubes, as you can see in the left-hand picture there, the blue beam tube is the one that houses uh, the cold source. Um, so it's time in, in another two years to replace the beryllium reflector again. Uh, and as we do that, we will be renewing the guide system for the cold guide hall, which is shown here on the right. Uh, and we will redesign, we won't just replace it like for like, we will upgrade the guide system and upgrade the instruments uh, at the same time. So there's a number of upgrades taking place together with the, the beryllium reflector replacement in 2024. Uh, as part of that, we will be expanding the cold guide hall so that we create more space. This will allow a much better space for the imaging instrument than where it currently is, which will increase its performance by about a factor of four. Uh, we're going to move the CTAC, which is a cold triple axis, from its current position to a much, much better position, uh, allowing it to increase its performance by 50 times seems like a reasonable estimate. That's game changing for, 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 for cold triple axis spectroscopy at Haifa. We will also be creating the space for a spin echo instrument, a uh, high resolution spin echo instrument. We don't have funding for that yet, uh, but we are designing in the, the, the place for it by uh, designing the guide accordingly. Um, and the other instruments which are in the cold guide hall will, will, will go back more or less as is, uh, notably the two SANS instruments. They will also see some improvements, noted most, mostly at, at, at short wavelengths. Uh, next slide, please. I'm sorry, Ken. Here is the timekeeper. Ten minutes Aha. left. How many, how many minutes? <laughs> Ten minutes. Ten uh, minutes. We want to give a buffer of five minutes questions. Uh, okay. If, if okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Um, so high for futures is, as you might imagine, something in the future. It's, it's how we see high for developing beyond uh, after the beryllium reflector replacement project in 2024. Haifa uh, is an old reactor. Uh, as I said, came online in 1965. Uh, if we replace the reactor pressure vessel, uh, it would extend the lifetime of the reactor I was going to say almost indefinitely, to the end of the century. Uh, and we had a, a review committee looking at that just last year, which uh, confirmed the mission need for replacing the reactor pressure vessel. Now that's, a, that, that, that's only, so that's called CD0 in the Department of Energy project speak. Um, and it means that they recognize that it needs to be done uh, and that the next step is for us to make the case for getting it funded. Um, that me, having the replacing the pressure vessel means that we can rebuild the beam tubes and we can rebuild the cold source and we can rebuild an awful lot of the infrastructure which is currently restricting the performance of some of the instruments at Haifa. So that could have a transformative impact on particularly the thermal instruments uh, in, the, in the beam room. Uh, so we are studying how uh, what the impact could be of that. One of the very exciting aspects is that we could, we would uh, move in the thermal instruments out of the beam room and build a guide hall for the thermal instruments. So a second guide hall um, pointing out at a kind of perpendicular direction to the cold guide hall, housing a similar number of instruments uh, and really bring HIFR up to, to, to world leading performance for its thermal instruments as well. Um, that has a very rather long time scale. We're looking at around probably the similar time scale to the second target station, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. So that brings me to the SNS upgrades. So there's two upgrade projects which are which are in progress at SNS. There's the PPU, the proton power upgrade, and the STS, the second target station. So the proton power upgrade will increase the accelerator power from 1.4 megawatts, where we are today, to 2.8 megawatts. Um, and the idea is that, firstly, that will provide more neutrons for the, for the existing target station, which is obviously good. You get more uh, flux on all the instruments. 
but I think a higher impact is that it provides uh, the, the, the right um, accelerator for diverting one pulse in four of the accelerator to the second target station and delivering 700 kilowatts to the second target station, uh, which will be optimized for cold neutrons uh, and large bandwidth applications, whereas the first target station is much more optimized for thermal neutrons and small bandwidth. Next slide, please. So here you can see the picture at the moment, 60 Hertz uh, accelerator uh, feeding the first target station at 1.4 megawatts. Um, I would like to emphasize that is the highest power proton accelerator in the world already today. Um, and then in the future, uh, we will be delivering two megawatts to the first target station and 700 kilowatts to the, to the, uh, to the second target station um, with a whole new range of, of, of instruments uh, optimized for something very different to what the first target station is optimized for. Uh, next slide, please. So here we outline the kinds of science which we expect the second target station to be to be really transformative within. Uh, it's about in, uh, cold neutrons, small samples, time resolved studies, and looking at hierarchical architectures, i.e., things which which have information over many length scales. Or, or over many timescales. And there's many systems which fall into these categories, uh, which I, I won't go into in the interest of time. But we have a, 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 a report on science at the, at the second target station called first, the First Experiments at STS Report, which I think is uh, it's a really good report. I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants, wants, to, wants to see that. Uh, next slide, please. So the second target station that is funded is underway. Um, we had, uh, you may may recall, I talked about CD zero uh, as as the milestone reached for the Hyper Futures. Uh, these are the critical decisions in the project management framework that that that, that we work within within the Department of Energy. Uh, we formally second target station formally reached CD one in uh, November last year which means that it's ready to move into uh, detailed design. Um, so we are planning for um, early, uh, early completion in 2032. That gives you the time scale overall. Um, on, this, on this plot, you can see how well we expect the second target station to perform compared to other facilities. Uh, the y-axis shows the peak brightness and the x-axis shows the time average brightness. Uh, at five angstrom neutron wavelength. So the second target station will really provide the highest peak brightness of any facility uh, in the world by a significant margin. Um, if you show this same plot at a different wavelength, you will see how the first target station performs well at shorter wavelengths. And HIFA, uh, as you, you can see down at the, at the kind of bottom right, uh, pr provides a very high time average brightness as you would expect. Next slide. Um, so here I get to the three source strategy. We will have HIFA, both cold and thermal, and we will have SNS first target station and SNS second target station. Why do we need all these facilities? Well, I tried to show with the science examples earlier on the complementarity between SNS and HIFA already now. Here I'm trying to show in a bit more technical way. If you draw out the neutron, the phase space between, let's say, neutron energy, uh, resolution and neutron bandwidth uh, and where the those facilities operate best shown on the right the kind of these 3d bubble diagrams they all op um, cover uh, different and only slightly overlapping volumes in this three-dimensional phase space right so if you want to go to large bandwidth low energies uh, and uh, medium resolution the second target station is the place to go. If you want to go for high energy, high resolution, um, then the first target station is the place to go. If you want to go for low bandwidth, low resolution, low energy, high for cold instrument is, is what you want to build and so on. So if you, if you collapse this 3D plot onto a 2D plane shown on the left, uh, here I'm trying to show where the different types of instruments belong in this landscape. And you can make these 
kind of plot for, for all instruments. It looks very busy. The point is that for every kind of instrument and for every kind of science, there's an optimal place to put it. Either the second target station, the first target station, Haifa cold guide hall or, or thermal instrument at Haifa. Uh, and that's how we maximize our scientific um, impact. So the final slide uh, is, is uh, next. And here, uh, basically sending the message that you should obviously do the science where you get the best results. Haifa, with its highest steady state brightness of thermal and cold neutrons, is where you go if you need monochromatic or polarized beams. It allows you to do parametric studies and kinetics extremely well and efficiently. SNS first target station, which has this very high peak brightness, particularly of thermal and hot neutrons, is where you go if you want high resolution and, uh, and more focused bandwidth. And that's particularly uh, uh, impactful in high resolution crystallography and fast and high energy dynamics. The second target station, which is with its very high peak brightness of cold neutrons, is where you go for the small beams and the large bandwidth uh, experiments. And as I mentioned, that is uh, falls naturally uh, to the strengths of hierarchical structures and should open up a new pathway for materials discovery. Uh, and with that, that is my final plug for the three source strategy at Oak Ridge. Thank you. Next, last slide. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Are we on you? Yeah. yeah, good. But thank you very much, Ken, for this great presentation. Apparently, we were able to overcome, to troubleshoot the connection issue from the beginning. So we have couple of questions, so maybe you can also read them yourself, but I will read them for you. So first question, what are the prospects for the IFA second guide all? Well, the prospects, I mean, it, it, it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a long-term vision, I would say. Um, we need to secure funding for the reactor pressure vessel replacement as the first step, and then we need to secure funding for the high for thermal guide hall. I'm very optimistic about this, uh, but I think the time scale for that is something like 2030. So I would like to emphasize that we don't have the funding for that yet, but we are preparing plans to make sure that we, to, to maximize the probability of funding and to make sure that we are ready for it. There are a number of opportunities coming, or coming available right now in the US. This is actually a very good time to be looking for infrastructure funding uh, with various COVID related stimulus packages uh, being debated in Congress and a new uh, administration having moved in a couple of months ago. Uh, things are looking promising, uh, but I would say the time scale for that is, is about 10 years from now. Okay, so another question. How do you manage the remote instrument access uh, with the strong IT safety requirements at Oak Ridge? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I I'm not sure I have a good technical answer to that. I mean, I can say that we are working very closely with our IT people. Uh, we, this is, we have a, an EPICS-based uh, control system. So our EPICS control people are working with the cybersecurity teams um, and, uh, uh, and IT more generally. Uh, I will say some, it's, it's an issue that we are aware of and we we cannot make ourselves vulnerable to, to hacks on, yeah. on instruments as we do that. Sure. And then there is a more general and I think curiosity question. What's the geographic spread of the user community? Uh, do you think uh, that there is a strong link between proximity of the institutions and the use of your facilities? Uh, maybe uh, this may change with more remote use in the future. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, we do, and, and this is part of the, the, the joy of being in this larger um, environment of the Oak Ridge National Lab. We have, a, we have quite a lot of users internally from mm -hmm. not within SNS or Haifa, but from Oak Ridge National Lab, Physical Sciences Directorate, for example. Um, and uh, we have users also across the US and from Europe and Japan and so on, uh, and China. Will it change? Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I think um, I would say that, uh, you know, we, we, it's, it has been very important to us to open up the possibility to do remote experiments. Um, I would not like to see remote experiments replace the kind the way we do, we have done experiments until now. Um, having somebody come physically on site, discussing with the instrument scientists, that is how you, you make, that's how you build a collaboration. That's how you maximize the, sound of the, 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 the added value of having instruments and instrument scientists on place. Um, so I think it's important that we make, we make remote experiments available, but I wouldn't like to see that as the predominant model for doing experiments here. Yeah, yeah, true. So we have a last question. So are high brilliance sources being considered the study at Oak Ridge? Um, so the short answer is no. Mm -hmm. uh, at Oak Ridge, uh, you know, we can't do everything. You know, we are already <laughs> doing a lot. We have uh, the most uh, intense uh, neutron sources in the U.S. Um, I know that there are projects for high brilliant sources both in the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, and uh, but I, I have the impression that this this is an area in which. Uh, we, we, Europe is very active right now, and we are very uh, we're following with great interest what's happening in places like Ulish and LLB and ESS Bilbao in those areas. Yeah, good. So, uh, okay, another question. So, thank you for the wonderful talk, one of our. Uh, so, is there a framework for? conducting long-term studies, so all this type of study be possible. For example, I work with batteries and I would be interested in examining a battery initially and then cycle for a month or so before collecting another measurement. Right. Is this possible? Okay, I have to admit, I don't know the answer to that question. It might be I'm a like... little bit specific, but yeah. we always uh, ask the, our like uh, audience, uh, maybe, I mean, uh, uh, you can find the, our speaker's contact on our official webpage and then they might actually get in contact specifically maybe with the Binance scientists and then ask yeah. a specific question like this one. Yeah, I would be happy. I, I will look into that. If you could send me that, that question so I, it's, and we, we keep yeah. track of it, I would be happy to, to provide an answer for that. I'm afraid I don't know. Yeah, great. So if there are no more questions. Yeah, last question. Uh, do you plan to implement spin echo small angle scattering techniques? <laughs> uh, I presume that relates to kind of the beam modulated uh, spin echo techniques, relying on resonant, uh, neutron resonant spin echo techniques. Um, I, so we, we do have an active. Um, uh, program in developing resonance spin echo uh, at HIFA and actually using it for things like ultra high resolution diffraction and and and, and phonon line widths. I'm not aware. Oh, oh no, there there have been tests to look at uh, implementing those for for small angle scattering, but I don't believe that's the main thrust of that research effort. Mm -hmm. 